even got a little piece of paper like this. You got, so this is mostly for Susan. <laughs> so this one actually is kind of mostly my notes of what I want to say to you. So if you want, we could just go home now and you could just read it. No? Okay. I'll talk it through. So it's, it's useful for people that, that like to have notes, something to write on, and say, what was that scripture you just read? He was talking too fast. So you can grab that if you want. Last week was Pentecost Sunday, and it was someone's birthday. Wh whose birthday was it? The church, the birthday of the church. And one of the things that I said when I was talking about that whole event was that when God birthed the church, he did something a little different than when most organized groups of people are birthed. I mentioned that when a nation is born, at least nowadays in the days of democracies, there's usually some documents written up, some articles of confederation we had in our nation during the war, the War of Independence, and then that was followed by a constitution, which lays out how the, how the thing's gonna run, how decisions will be made, who makes decisions, who enforces decisions, um, what do you do in times of confusion, how do you, what are the rules, all the, laid out how you're gonna live. And when an organization, like a, a corporation is incorporated, in the United States at least, you have articles of incorporation, you have bylaws, you have a list of things. And even when God birthed the nation of Israel as they came out of slavery in Egypt, God gave them the Mosaic Covenant at Mount Sinai, where, um, well, you know the Ten Commandments, which would probably be enough. If we would just do that, I understand there probably wouldn't be any need for news if there were no breaking of the Ten Commandments. Can you imagine? Like, what would we talk about? <laughs> well, someone loved their neighbor again. <laughs> what are you going to, there's nothing to talk about, right? Um, but then there was a lot more than that. A whole list of instructions of how they would keep the covenant. But when God birthed the church, on that festival of Pentecost, that Jewish festival, the one that came 50 days after Jesus' death and then his resurrection, which happened on Passover, he gave something different. He gave himself the living presence of God, his personal presence to live within the people. In a way, he said, I'd write my instructions on your heart instead of on tablets of stone like I did before. And I will put my spirit in you and I'll move you to follow my ways. And it changes the dynamic of everything. And I, as I was thinking this week and praying, I actually had a whole nother little mini-series I'm going to start. And I was praying, I think on Friday morning, and I felt like the Holy Spirit sort of nudged me and said, don't, don't go there. I, let's talk more about we talked about last week, and if I was hearing right, maybe I was hearing wrong, maybe it was my imagination, I don't know, but I think it was maybe the Lord, um, I felt like we should explore that a little more. Now normally, especially in a church like ours where we believe in praying for the sick and casting out demons and a little praying in tongues here and there, like the charismatic kind of stuff, we, we often talk about the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. But I want to address a different focus about what the Holy Spirit's presence means in us and how it changes how we approach our life. So it's called living in the light of Pentecost. And that's why you see on the screen the flame. You remember on the day of Pentecost, there were the tongues of fire. So I want to I wanna explore this with you. You, you game? You going to go there with me? Okay, let's pray and ask God to help the preacher. Jesus, help me. Oh, Lord, we love you. You are here, and we've already felt you and experienced your presence, and we like it. We love your presence, Holy Spirit. We want you to know you are so welcome in this place. We want to interact with you. We want to hear from you. We want you to speak with us, to us, into us, through us. As we explore your scriptures today, living God, we're asking that you instruct us in the way we should live. 
Help us. Guide us. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So just a quick review. Some of you weren't here, perhaps, or some of you, the story is somewhat new. There's a book in the Bible called Acts. Not Acts like chop down a tree, but Acts like A-C-T, things people do. And it's the Acts of the New Church. It's, it's called, sometimes more long, the Acts of the Apostles. But it's the, it's the story of what happened after Jesus did his ministry and gathered followers and then died on the cross for our sins, for the sins of the world, and then rose from the dead victorious over hell, over the grave, over Satan himself, established the beginnings of the new creation life. He rose from the dead. He hung out with the disciples for about 40 days, actually 440 days after that, teaching them about the kingdom of God. And then he said, you know what, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to send you the promised Holy Spirit, the, the gift that we've been talking about is going to come. I'm going to live in you. I've, he's been with you, but he's going to be in you. And you are going to go and be my witnesses to the rest of the whole world, which was a big deal to tell a few uneducated Jewish people in an occupied territory. You're going to take a message that I've been teaching you to the whole world. So that's where Acts, the book, begins, and you ought to read it. It's an adventure book. And it starts out like this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. It was 120 of them. Suddenly a sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. They were probably remembering that John the Baptist had said, One's coming after me. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. What do you think that felt like? The filling of the Holy Spirit. Terrifying? Maybe. Exhilarating joy. Like an, if you've ever experienced the, the coming on you of the Holy Spirit in those kind of moments, there's um, power, um, there's presence, there's joy, there's exhilaration, there's hope. There's, it's like a taste of the kingdom of God has come really full force into you. They begin to speak in other tongues, the Spirit enabled them. Peter gets up as you read through this chapter and explains to a crowd of people that have gathered, wherever they are meeting, we don't really know, but a large crowd is gathered, and he explains to them what has happened. He preaches to them about Jesus who's been crucified, who's been raised from the dead, who has sent this Holy Spirit that was promised for centuries ago, especially he reads the prophet Joel to them. They're cut to the heart, and some of them just burst out saying, what should we do? And he says this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. And in those words, Peter established that this gift of the Holy Spirit that those first 120 disciples experienced is for all of us who will follow Jesus from then until Jesus returns. So this is for us, and the fact is that anyone who has put their faith in Jesus and become a follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit living inside you. And we want to talk about living in the light of Pentecost and one particular aspect about how that changes everything. So here, here's my approach today. People, and that'd be like you, very, very frequently want to know what is the will of God for my life. And they, are, they go for prayer. They will say, well, I just want to know what God wants me to do. Anyone experience that? If they believe in prophetic gifts, they'll look for someone who's gifted prophetically and say, do you have a word for me? Do you know what God wants me to be, what God wants me to do, where he's going to send me, how I should respond. There's this, I want to know the data. I want to know the facts. And remember, I started out saying God didn't birth the church with a new Torah, a new list of instructions for how we're supposed to do everything. He gave us the Holy Spirit. We could, in hearing that the Holy Spirit comes well, here it is, John 16, 13. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all truth. We could hear that and think, oh, good, I can get the list now. 
The list that he didn't write down, I'll go to audible.com instead and have the Holy Spirit read the list to me. And then I'll know what I should do because I don't want to have to figure it out on my own and walk through this kind of confused, kind of feeling a little bit like I'm walking in the dark. But that's not the kind of Holy Spirit guidance God wants to give us, as far as I can tell. He doesn't just get... See, that would be transactional. I don't want to have any relationship with this Holy Spirit. I just want him to give me the facts, just the facts, so I can get to work. I want to know the will of God for my life. I can get to work, and I don't have to bother with you anymore. We don't say that. We don't think that, but that's the, that's the attitude Sort of. Do you see that? Could be. So, I think that the leading of the Holy Spirit is most normally less about telling me exactly the practices that God wants me to do and more about how to become the kind of person God wants me to be. Big difference. And that requires a relationship with the indwelling Spirit of God. It's a lot different. Can you feel it already? Ooh, I like this come on guy. <laughs> See, when <laughs> when I am becoming the kind of person God wants me to become, then I am living in the will of God probably no matter what specific doing I'm doing. Because I'm being, and out of my being flows the doing, and it's in line with the will of God. And now, I get to have some kind of part to play. But I think it's about becoming the kind of person that God wants me to become. This week, a few days ago, I tried to log on to my internet banking app on my web browser on my computer. Has anyone ever tried to do that? I entered my username, entered my password, and it came back and it said, we want to text you a authorization code for secondary authentication to your phone. And I said, this number? And it texted me the number, I got it on my phone, I typed it into the web browser, and then a new screen came up and said, oh, we would also like you to call this number for additional authentication. Now that was new, because usually by now I'm done, I got my information, and I move on. Are any of you in a hurry? <laughs> I didn't have time for this, I'm a busy man. <laughs> so I call the number, and I don't get like a, we're glad you called, here's your other number. I get the long voice menu that says, if you would like to know your balance, press number one. You know, for information about this, press two, and then you're, you're listening. Okay, now you're, now you're to number seven, I think. And the one you don't, what you want isn't there. There was no press this number for the further authentication. So then there's, I'm like, um, speak to a representative. And it's talking to me. I speak to a representative. Finally... Please enter this information so we can direct you to the right person. Have you done this? So now they want to know my uh, last four digits of my social and my um, birth date. And then a lady comes on. And she's not in America, of course. And, <laughs> and she goes through the whole thing again. Oh, could you tell me your address? Now, I should have long been done with a little bit of information that I thought I wanted to get. And the last for your social. And okay, now she's authenticated me. How can I help you? Well, I just logged onto your computer, my computer, trying to get into my um, account. And it said that I should do this and that and that. And then I should call this number, and then you would give me a number. And she said, oh, let me look for that. And then I get the number and try that. And now I'm logged on. I'm like, thank you. And now we're 10 minutes into this. And, and she... Um, I said, why did this happen? And she started making stuff up. Have you ever heard the tech person make stuff up? Well, it's maybe because of 
uh, you're, you changed something on your phone. I said, no, did you hear me? I was using the web app. Well, we need authentication. Well, I gave you my username and my password, and you sent me a code, and I did the whole thing, and I was getting irritated. Have you ever been irritated with tech support person? So, you, if you know me well enough, you know that I can, in my more fleshly moments, become the arrogant geek type. Have you ever seen that? My kids have seen me do this. My son just raised his hand. So now I proceed to tell her, like the arrogant geek guy. You know that, the guy that was in Jurassic Park that was like selling the eggs and he was just a jerk? So, I let her know why she was wrong and why I was right. And I felt a little, maybe pride, in straightening this poor woman out. And I said some kind of thank you, well I hope next time it doesn't take me 10 minutes to log onto my account and hung up the phone. Yay, run, until the Holy Spirit said, I didn't really like the way you handled that. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. <laughs> and he didn't right there give me a list of the will of God for my life, what to do. He gave me an impression of the will of God for my life, which has something to do with love your neighbor as yourself. And right then, that poor tech support woman from another country was my neighbor. And I, I messed up. Living in the light of Pentecost. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. He's more about helping us become the kind of person that he wants us to be than telling us what to do. Get it? In Colossians, Paul says this. One sentence. He's talking to a church of people, and he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus, he sends his greetings. He's always wrestling in prayer for you that... You may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. How would it be to stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured? I think this is, sorry, I think this is how the presence of the Holy Spirit in me is at work to lead me and to guide me in truth. To constantly be changing. I mean, he does the other stuff too. The prophetic words, the power and all that. But a primary thing I want us to grasp is the ongoing relationship with God where he can talk to me and I can talk to him. And if he wants to, he can say, you're doing good over here, but over here, I want to adjust this. And I want to train you to be the kind of person who does two primary things. You love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. Ron, if you get those in your character, I don't really care what you do. Because what you do will be right in my will. In fact, I love your creativity, Ron. I made you to think for yourself. So why don't you take that loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself and come up with ways to implement it? And I'm going to support you. But I want to know where to go today. Well, go where you want. But love God and love people. Would that work for you? I, now, there is absolutely times when you can be driving down the street and God can literally say, don't go your usual way, go left. Has that ever happened to anyone? Really? That was a lot of oh yeses. I've told you this story. Um, oh, do I want to tell a story? Uh, I remember my roommate before I was married. Uh, so this is a while back. And you've heard this story, some of you, but it's, it's just a great story. He was going to do his laundry at a laundromat, 
And the Holy Spirit said, don't go to your laundromat, go to another one. Now, how does the Holy Spirit say that? Do you think it came across his radio? Like 91X, stop playing, what were they playing back then? <laughs> you too. And, <laughs> and, um, and the voice came on, don't go to your usual laundromat. Go to the one on C Street, whatever. No, he had an impression, but it was an impression that came out of nowhere, and he identified, oh, God's talking. So he goes to the other laundromat, and when he gets there, he meets this girl. No, it was good. And she was, I think she was, she was strung out on some kind of drug, and he knew, oh, God wants me to minister to her. That's why I'm here. And next thing we know, she's in church. Next thing you know, she's in our young adult group. Next thing you know, she's saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, serving Jesus. Because God can say, turn left, turn right. But I, for, for today, I really want to emphasize to this a conversational relationship that's ongoing with God, the Holy Spirit, who lives in you. And then you can do what you want. Uh, in his book, Hearing God, which I'd recommend to you, Hearing God by Dallas Willard. I'm going to quote him again later, but he says this, Our obsession with merely doing all that God's commands may be the very thing that rules out being the kind of person that he calls us to be. I'll read that again. Our obsession with merely doing all that God commands may be the very thing that rules out being the kind of person he calls us to be. Isn't that interesting? Like you could hear from God about doing this particular thing, go to this place, do this thing, follow the instructions, and not have a heart full of love. You could actually be a jerk and be in the right place doing the thing, but you're not in the will of God. And you want to be in the will of God, right? So here's another quote from that same book. God has created us for intimate friendship with himself, both now and forever. This is the Christian viewpoint. Let's pause for a second on that. Can you see yourself as one that God has created for intimate friendship with him? It would change everything. Living in the light of Pentecost could mean that now that the Holy Spirit is in you, dwelling in you, God's personal presence, because you've decided to follow Jesus, you've decided to follow him with your whole life, you've turned away from living apart from him, you're following him now, the Spirit of God lives within you, and he wants not just you to be a servant, he wants to be your friend. Here's Jesus' words, I no longer call you servants, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. I think this is true not just for those 12 guys. I think this is true for all the followers of Jesus, all the disciples. And that's most of you in this room. Could be all of you by the end of the day, I hope. In Exodus 33, the story is the time that... Uh, Moses has just been on the mountain getting the Mosaic Covenant, the Sinai Covenant. He's come down the mountain. The people have sinned greatly. They made that golden calf and were sacrificing and all that's going on. And we're told at that, in that t part of the story that Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the Tent of Meeting. And anyone inquiring of the Lord would go then to that meeting place outside the camp. Just, and I haven't even read the scripture. I'm going to read to you yet. It's the next verse after that. But it's where Moses is called a friend of God or he's friendly with God. Moses made a practice of having a place where he would go to meet with God. Sounds like friends. Do you have a practice of making a place where you regularly go to meet with God? If you don't, why not start? Live in the light of Pentecost as a friend of God. 
Watch how it changes your life. It may be a particular place in your house where you get up a little earlier and drink your hot beverage of tea or coffee in the morning and pause to meet with God on a regular basis. Some of you, I know, uh, one practice some people do is they actually set an empty chair and say, God, that's your chair. I want to talk with you today. And they just have a visual and they meet with God and listen and wait. So here's, here's what I wanted to read to you. Set up this tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to his tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, the son of Nun, did not leave the tent. We're just getting to know Joshua in the story. I like the fact that Joshua, Moses' aide, would go and be there, and then Moses would be done with his business with God, but Joshua would be like, I think I'm going to hang out a little while. I love this presence. I love this presence at this tent. I'm just going to stay here. That's what some of you do when we end our church services and the worship band's kind of playing and you just kind of sit and you're like, I'm just going to stay in this presence. It's a good place to be. And Joshua didn't know at this time that God was preparing him to eventually take Moses' place and be the one who would lead the children of Israel into the promised land. But it started with him just hanging out in the presence. But Moses would be like God's friend. And I think that's what God wants for you. You think? When I was 17 years old, which was just not that long ago, as you can tell. Well, with the Lord, a day is is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So it was less than a day ago. I was 17, and some of you know this story, but the day after I graduated from high school in Phoenix, where I grew up, my family, my parents, and I moved to Oceanside right up the street from the Oak Riparian Park over there on Lake and Ridge Road, that intersection. We lived on that street, 1982, and I was in a foreign land. I came from Phoenix. In Arizona, you can carry a gun on a holster if you want. It's not California. And I knew no one here, and I was 17. And in a a different environment. I didn't dress right. Californian people were cool. I was not. (laughs) And I didn't know anyone. And I used to walk around those streets, around Ridge Road and Lake, and have conversations with Jesus. And I did a lot. And I developed a really cool friendship with Jesus. And I'd tell him how I was feeling. And he'd kind of give me impressions. But I was literally having a relationship with a friend. And I did it a lot. And then later, I got a job a little later in that summer. And I found a church that I went to. And then I got involved in the church. And then fall came. And I went to UC San Diego, Ravel College, which was nuts with my workload. And I had my job. And I was now involved in a church. And I was busy, 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 busy. And I didn't have my walks anymore. And literally, I missed being lonely without knowing anyone because in my loneliness, I found a friend. And I learned something that stuck with me to this day. And I, I will counsel people that are facing some kind of emotional pain. I'll tell them, you know what? Don't do everything you can to avoid the pain or get rid of the pain. Press into the pain and see if you find Jesus there. And he'll walk with you. And he might not take away the pain, but it will be transformed because you'll be walking through the pain with a really good friend. Have you ever walked through pain with a friend? Did you know you can have intimate friendship with God? Living in the light of Pentecost, I think, Includes that because God himself, the personal presence of God, is dwelling in you. 
And then, so later, I'm now I'm in college, and, you know, if you go to, well, I lived in Vista at this point, and I commuted to La Jolla to go to college. Now, if, if you've never been to college, you might not know this, but it's not like high school when you go to school, you start your day, and you go class, 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 and you go home. You might go on Tuesdays and Thursdays and have two classes, and they're an hour and a half long. So you have one class at 9 a.m., and then the next class is at 2.30. So you have these big gaps. And so in that environment, I used to go to this particular cafe over in Revelle College, and I'd get a 20-ounce cup of coffee and these blueberry muffins that had the sprinkles on top, the sugar sprinkles. Mm. And I'd go there, and I'd have a coffee date with God. And I would really hope that no one would know me and see me and come and interrupt our date. And that's where I learned to open my Bible. You know, I'm 18 years old probably at this point, 18, 19. And just kind of read a passage and go, wait, what did you say? Let's look at that again. And I, well, what did you mean by this? And I just talked to God. I, hope, I might have talked out loud. I do that sometimes. <laughs> If you see me talking out loud, I'm literally talking. I'm having a conversation with the Lord. I'm not crazy. Well, I'm crazy, but it's not evidence of my craziness. So I'd read the Bible and talk, and I wasn't in a hurry to try to read through the Bible. I was just wanting to have friendship with God and interact with his word. And maybe I'd read part of a chapter in one of Paul's letters, and I'd ask God, what did that mean? And Oh, I draw a circle, and oh, this, he's referring to that thing, and I'd start writing in my Bible, and I learned to love the Word of God. In fact, I remember even writing a song at that time about, to the Lord, about how much I loved His Word and how it gave life to me, because I was learning about friendship with God. I say all that just to try to make an example for you to, to understand what's available. I want every follower of Jesus to know about intimacy with God. And that's the primary message just for today, how we are living in the light of Pentecost. Because God didn't give us a set of rules so we get to work, you know, checking off the boxes of how to do the thing. He gave us himself, not so that we could ask him, well, what's the things I need to do? He gave us himself so that we could have friendship with him, so we could talk with him, so we could learn his ways, and in that process, he'll give us specific directions. He does that to me. But it's more about friendship. Jesus said some words that indicate this. Jesus is inviting you into his intimate circle of friendship that he's had forever with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And in following Jesus, we are invited to join that party. Here's his words, John 14. On that day, you will realize, they've been taught it, but they didn't realize it. You will realize, you'll know, I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands will obey them. He's the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father. I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, but I'm glad John told us that, because if we thought it was Judas Iscariot, we're like, well, I can not listen to this. But this is the other Judas, so we can listen. Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? He's, he's like, Lord, why are you being so exclusive? Why just us? And not everybody. And Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. Well, why would love result in obeying his teaching? If you are in a love relationship with someone, you've learned to trust them. And if you trust someone and they ask you to do something, you don't even have to understand it. Because you love them and you trust them. So you just do it because they told you to, right? You don't say, well, wait a minute, I wanna, let's, let's find out why are you asking me to do this? What's your angle? You don't do that with someone you love, right? You just trust them and do it, hopefully. Anyone married? 
just that was triggering. Yeah, if your wife, whom you love, husbands, asks you to do something, I'm not saying that I do this all that well. Kim laughed a little too loud there. <laughs> just, just, we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> but if I love Kim and she asks me to do something and I trust her, how about if I just go do it? Okay, so Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. I think that's how that works. And listen to the next thing. My father, my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home in him. Does that sound like a transactional relationship of just giving you the facts about what to do? We will make our home in you. I mean, that's beautiful. I follow Jesus, and he says, I have come by my Holy Spirit with my Father and made my home in you. Wow. It's amazing. Abraham, James says, believed God and was credited him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. So I'm just, you know, giving us some illustrations, some stories of people that were God's friend. And there's a great interesting story that might be new to you, some of you. you if you haven't heard it, it's, it's somewhat funny, in my opinion, that illustrates Abraham's friendship with God. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Remember, Jesus said, I, I'm your friend now. You're my friend. I tell you what I'm up to. So Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. All the nations on earth will be blessed through him. I've chosen him so that he'll direct his children and household to keep my way, the way of the Lord, by doing what's right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he's promised. So I don't think I'm going to hide anything from this guy. He's my friend, and he was called the friend of God. So God just says, uh, Abraham, you know, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, those two cities, it's come to me. It's so great. Their sin is so grievous that I'm going to go down and see if what they've done is as bad as what I've heard. And I will know. The men that were with him turned away towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And the, the implication is, I'm going to do some destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah, if it's as bad as I hear. And he's going to rain down fire and brimstone and just destroy the city, basically. And Abraham, who's a friend of God, has this conversation. And Abraham says... Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in this city? Far be it from you to do such a thing. That's how you talk with a friend, isn't it? To kill the righteous with the wicked? Treating the righteous and the wicked alike? Far be it from you. Will not the judge of the earth do right? I mean, that's kind of some chutzpah to talk to God like that, don't you think? The Lord said, okay, if I find 50... I, 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 won't, I won't hurt the place. I'll spare the place for those 50 people. And Abraham said, well, I've been kind of bold to speak to you, God, but since we're talking, I'm nothing but dust and ashes. I get that. But uh, what if it's only 45 righteous people? What are you going to do then? We destroy the whole city just because there's five fewer than 50? And God says, okay, if I find 45 there, I won't destroy it. Moses, uh, Abraham goes, oh, what about if there's only 40? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a funny conversation, isn't it? By the way, this is God's way. And God was not put off by Abraham being so bold with him. I think God knew what he was going to do from the beginning. But he wanted to have a conversation with his friend. Okay, 40, okay. And then he said, well, don't be angry, but let me speak. What if there's only 30? <laughs> and God says, okay, if there's only 30... Abraham said, well, I've been bold. How about 25? He said, for the sake of 25. 20? <laughs> Don't be angry. What if there's only 10? And God says, okay, for 10, I won't destroy it. By the way, he didn't find 10 righteous people in the city. So he destroyed it. Can you imagine having a conversation like that with God? Jesus said, I've called you to be my friends. I was, 
I was in Columbus at a vineyard conference um, a month ago, I guess, and I was introduced to a young man from Cincinnati who was there. Some guy said, oh, you'd like to meet this guy, and he was 25 years old, so big age difference. Um, he's from another race, another culture, different, I mean, different world than I am. But we, there was like an instant connection. I just had met him. We were having a conversation. And suddenly, I felt like God showed me a bit of how God had created him and the depth of really interesting things about his personhood, his personality, some stuff about his life. And I just mentioned that to him. And he was like, Wow. That's very accurate. And then, suddenly, I felt this overwhelming sense of the importance of this young man's life into the, you know, his old age. And things that God wants to do through him. And how painful his life would be to get there. The things he'd have to go through. And, I, and it, was, it was an interesting experience because I felt it so strongly that I literally began to weep. And then prayed over him regarding this situation, regarding his life, and blessed him. And since then, we've been texting like we're friends now. This strange person that I met from another city, from another race, from another age... You know, he's 25, I'm like 125, and so there's a big difference. Um, last week we had a really great video chat, and how did that happen? The Holy Spirit in me decided to show me something about another human being so that I could be a father figure and love him, and he doesn't have a father, by the way. I mean, is that weird? Isn't that cool? You are called to live that way. Because you have the presence, the personal presence of the living God inside of you. Inside of you. And he has called you to partner with him. He's got a plan for the world. Here's a great quote from a guy named Brother Lawrence. There is not in the world a kind of life more sweet and delightful than that of a continual conversation with God. Those only can comprehend it who practice it and experience it. Yet I do not advise you to do it from that motive. It's not pleasure which we ought to seek in this exercise, but let us do it from a principle of love, loving God, and because God would have us to. That's right. Living in the light of Pentecost, we've been invited into an intimate friendship with God. Fellowship. Friendship with the Trinitarian God in the same way that Jesus the man, Jesus the son of man, had been living in fellowship with God so that we can become trusted friends of God. So that we can be the kind of people that God can trust us to do whatever we want. Because whatever we want will be what he wants. Have you ever been so close to someone that all they need to do is look at you a certain way? If you're married, you know this. Like, especially if you're doing the wrong thing and they go, <laughs> you know the look? You don't need any words, right? Or they give the, the smile like they're so approving. Yeah, that was, that was awesome what you just did. God, I believe, wants us to be that kind of mature, assured people who have a presence of the Holy Spirit living in us, advising us, guiding us, helping us to become more like Jesus so that whatever we pray, God can say, yeah, I'm going to do that. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do because I can trust you. Because you're my friend, and I have shown you my ways. You know, in Psalm 103, it says, God showed his ways to Moses, but he showed his acts, his deeds, to the children of Israel. But his ways, he showed Moses what he was like. I 
hope you have a hunger right now to develop friendship with God as you live in the light of what Pentecost has accomplished. And I, I want to, um, you know, our time's up, so it's time to, to land the sermon. <laughs> Let the people say amen. <laughs> I want to launch into ministry time. And I have one sense of some, of some people here that, that the Lord would like to minister to. So we're going to have a ministry team come to the front. And we're going to have a worship band come up in like now or soon. Um, Holy Spirit, we invite you to continue what you've been doing and, and rest on us. And as I was praying earlier this morning, I felt like there would be someone here who used to have a really close, intimate friendship with God. And for some reason, your life has gone in such a way that that has waned. And as my talking, you remembered. And you have a desire to get that relationship going again. If that's you, we want to pray over you and join you in that experience and bless you. And so, you know, when, in a moment when I invite people to come out and get prayer, I'd love for you to come and have people pray over you and, and get right back in the game, right back into the intimate fellowship with the Lord. What else, Lord? Holy Spirit, we love you. What do you have to say? It's okay to wait before the Lord if you haven't figured that out. You know, if you're here and what I just said was not your experience ever, but you're thinking, I want to have this kind of infilling of the presence of God where I know his presence and experience his voice in my heart and mind where he speaks to me and walks with me. We want to pray over you, too, to have an experience maybe like Pentecost, like these guys had that we just read about in Acts 2. So I think some of you might be in that situation. Mm. Let's, let's stand together. Lord, we love you. We love you, Father God, who sent your Son. We love you, Jesus, who gave your life for us rose from the dead. We love you, Holy Spirit, who's come to dwell in everyone who follows Jesus, to dwell in your church, that we would be the people of the presence of God. We love you, and we thirst for you like people that are thirsty, but we heard from Isaiah that you would take the wilderness and the desert and cause it to burst into bloom, and there'd be streams where there was once dryness. So today we're asking let streams flow in our hearts. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill your church once again. Make us a people that radiate the character and the joy and the love and the peace of God himself. Everywhere we go, bring in an experience of your presence. Lord, make us that kind of people. And Lord, I pray, bless this ministry time as some people get some prayer, as hands are laid on. Fill people with the Holy Spirit. Give them gifts of the Holy Spirit. Bless them today, Lord. Bless this congregation. Bless the people that are listening. Anyone who's listening to me right now and you've never invited Jesus into your life, if you haven't figured out, it's super simple. He says, come, follow me, and you go, yes. And you're in. That's about it. He says, come follow me, and you go, okay, I found it. You've got life, and I want life. I'm going for you, and you follow Jesus. He says, I'm turning from my old way of life and following you. Take away my sins. Give me new life in Jesus. Do that, you're in. And if that's you, come, and we want to pray over you too.